So we want to talk a little bit now about one of the issues that we found within the Parthenos cluster, which is the, the cluster of research infrastructures that I am involved with, um, and which includes Clarion and Daria and um, also infrastructures for um, cultural heritage preservation. So a very wide range of cultural infrastructures. And some of the shared knowledge that we have about the issues that are most prominent in trying to run something at infrastructure scale. Remember, we went through all these different models of things that were tools and things that were projects. Well, once you're at infrastructure scale, you have a number of different challenges. So the first thing I'd like to, to, to explore a little bit under this is the idea of user engagement. Because if you're working in a, in a very kind of closed universe where you know all your users, you can be pretty sure you're meeting their needs. They'll tell you. However, if you're in a more open universe where you're never going to meet all of your users face to face, then you're going to need to invoke different kinds of processes to make sure that that is built in to the project and to the infrastructure development from the beginning. So I think the paradigm of user engagement has changed a lot over the past maybe 20 years. Um, obviously changed as we've matured as a society developing technologies. And I think if you look back to kind of the early days of, of technology development and user engagement, you'll find a lot of paternalistic statements, and you will still find them sometimes today. This development of, well, we'll kind of, we did it this way because that's definitely what the user wants. And it may or may not actually have come from any interaction with the user at all. It may just be something that's an assumption of what the user wants. Or sometimes it's actually just an incremental development of what the technology developer will find easy. Um, so you have this almost paternalistic approach that has changed over time into what's known as user-centered design. And I, I have this wonderful picture from uh, the cover of Don Norman's book, The Design of Everyday Things. Um, and it's a great illustration of what where user-centered design, user design came from. Because the whole idea that this might be a beautiful coffee pot, but if you pick it up and try and pour it, you as the user will suffer. So the idea of actually engaging with the users and bringing them into the process became more and more a part of the mentality of how things were d developed. And so the idea now that we hear a lot is about the whole user experience. And this goes quite deep. It's not just about what the user sees in the interface. It's about how the bits fit together kind of under the hood and how that actually supports the users working the way they want to. Again, this is going back to this idea of being below the level of the work. And now we also see this more and more emerging paradigm of co-creation or participatory design. And that is where you would have the users directly involved in every phase of the design. I'm going to give you a worked example of that kind of design methodology in a minute. But just to tell you first, again, because this is coming out of the, the Parthenos project, it's quite interesting to see how we actually end up looking at user requirements. So because we are a cluster of many research infrastructure projects, we felt we had all of that user engagement work was going to be documented and available to us from the very beginning. Ah, so we brought all this together and we did a big survey of all the information that had been done in the various projects that we, we all represented. A massive document, 320 pages, publicly available if you're really interested in it. And there was a lot of themes that came out that we wanted to try and map the user requirements to. So we wanted to look at what kind of user requirements were there in terms of standards. Did people understand standards? Did they have what they need? What kinds of user requirements were there in terms of training? Were people actually getting the training they needed to be able to access and find and use the infrastructures? And things like that. However, what we found is in these documents, these tens of documents, hundreds of documents perhaps even, that we were looking at with user requirements all in them, we found most of the requirements were focused on the tools. And that in most cases, the way the research infrastructure saw their users' needs were really at that tip of the iceberg. So we're going to develop a tool for that. The whole idea of bringing it down lower, um, of actually saying, well, what do people need in terms of interoperability? What do people need to know in terms of standards? What do people need to know in terms of the policy environment? Licensing and IPR. How were these user needs investigated? In most cases, they weren't. In most cases, the user needs that we saw expressed, those things were implicit, and they were understood by the project teams, but there was not a direct interaction with the users about them, which is an interesting thing to learn, because I don't think any of us in those projects actually realized what we were doing or how we may have been encouraging a kind of a blind spot in what we were doing. Um, so there were lots of other documents that were 
describing project decisions, but again, they didn't give the underlying user evidence. And so they were either based on expert knowledge, which may be very robust, or they were based on a kind of a gut feeling, which also may be very robust, but they weren't double-checked with the users. And so that evidence base was, was lacking. So that really brought home to us the fact that actually making sure you have very extensive engagement, very extensive incorporation of the users in the development of an infrastructure project. Not all of them, but a representative set was going to be very important. And this leads me to the example I want to give of how the user input was integrated into the Sendari project. Now, as I mentioned, Sendari is a, the Collaborative European Digital Archival Research Infrastructure. It's one of the partners in Parthenos. Um, and it was meant to be for medieval and modern historians. Now, that's a pretty big group. We weren't going to get them all in. So what we decided we would do is we would have a kind of a waterfall approach, not just to the technology development, but also to the way in which we brought the users in. And it went through these various stages, plus a few more that we developed at the end. And the first of these were these participatory design sessions. So you can see a lot of people sitting around tables and an even mix between the people who are going to be developing the infrastructure and also the people who are going to be using infrastructure. And these sessions usually started with a kind of a presentation about, well, these are kinds of things that people like you use, and then went on to um, very extensive brainstorming and then kind of an ideation session. And the outcomes of these sessions were these sort of video prototypes where we would give the various groups a camera, some post-its, and a number of sort of like a mock-up of a, of a computer screen and a, um, a printout of an arrow on a clear piece of film so they could move it around while they were actually using the camera to capture their sort of idealized version of what their environment would look like. So these are just a couple of screenshots from a couple of the ones that they did. Um, one is a presentation export tool, a very useful thing for a, um, a, a researcher to have. Another thing that was uh, for mapping documents and files. Now remember what I just said earlier about the Parthenos work. We were very much focused on the tools, uh, but the methodology by which we got the information out I think was very good. And I think in a later iteration we would just expand this out to more areas and get a better sense of how things like interoperability played into this. But the next step beyond these video prototypes, which gave us really quick snapshots of what people were looking for, was to go to user scenarios. Now user scenario is a long description in the researcher's own words of a research process. So things that they want to do, things that they, they're, how, how they're formulating their research questions, um, how they need to gather data, things that they're interested in doing, specific methodologies if they know them. And then these user scenarios are broken down into user stories. So, and these are much more um, uh, specific to what's the role of the person who's talking about this. Um, and what do they want to do? And then what's the benefit of that? And then referring back to um, the scenario. So this is a, a modified Coburn type of approach. Uh, and there's lots of information about that approach that's out there if you want to pursue that. This gave us actually a very good roadmap for the kinds of, of things we wanted to develop. But that wasn't far enough because although we had that roadmap, we wanted to get deeper into it. We wanted to actually find out, well, what does this look like when we develop it? And we couldn't develop all of them. So we did two prototypes, one of which ended up becoming the note-taking environment, which is the front end of the Sendari project, and the other one became um, some of the, the background integration with linked data that underpins the medieval side of the, of the infrastructure. And those two prototypes are very useful because that gave the, the technology experts a chance to really engage very deeply over a sustained period of months with one researcher. Again, it's a representative sample, but much more intensive than we would have had before. We had three summer schools where we brought in young researchers to talk about their needs, but also to work with the infrastructure and elements of it as it was in development. Um, we had transnational access fellows, people who would be coming in from the outside to do projects in the various partner institutions, and their projects became a part of how we understood the needs of our users. There's also a trusted user group, and this was extremely useful. Um, we were hoping to get about 20 people in the trusted user group. In the end, we had a group of about 90 who engaged with us. And for each phase of the testing, every month for about the last nine months of the project, um, it was, uh, the, the trusted user group ended a little bit before the end of the project, uh, but they would have a webinar that would say, okay, this is the latest release of this tool. It does this. It doesn't do this. It has this bug. Ignore that bit. Um, but then people who were really interested in the project and really interested in you know, the, the cutting edge of digital humanities would be able to engage a bit with it, 
get a look at what was going on, try the tools out in a very well-supported environment, and then um, give us feedback as to how they would like to see those various tools develop. Um, and in the end phase of the project development, so for about the last six months, we had a weekly teleconference between the technical developers and the historians who are working within the, the uh, environment itself. And those weekly sessions were almost like a more intense version of the trusted user group. So it was very much about um, this bug needs to be fixed, this took too long, this, had, um, this didn't give me the results I expected, um, this is not functioning as well as it had before. So this kind of strong oversight from people who really could check and say, no, those results aren't right. Um, because I know this area and I know this content. Very important for us in the development of a strong user profile within the infrastructure. And I think this is really something that many research infrastructures are going to have to learn more and more about as they become more and more embedded in a, a wide research base.